All right, uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me in the back? All right, great. Uh, good afternoon, welcome, find your seat. Let's uh, get started. Uh, today we're going to talk about linear models and this is the second time we're going to talk about linear models. Um, I got some questions last week uh, from different people that indicated that a few things weren't uh, quite right. Specifically, uh, some of the most important concept hadn't quite s uh, concepts hadn't quite sunk in with some people. And it turns out that my efforts to keep the slides aligned with the book and to keep the explanations roughly the same or as much as possible the same uh, weren't that successful uh, as the feedback I got from people who've started reading the book. It really does look like uh, Peter Flack talks about these things in a very different way than I do. So I thought for the first half of this lecture we should review basically what we've learned, what we've seen so far about linear models, uh, try and align it a little bit more with the book, and re-emphasize some of these important, uh, important principles and important subjects. Because as you've seen hopefully by now, the linear model for the way I teach this course, at least for the way I teach machine learning, it's very fundamental. It's like a very basic building block for almost all of the methods that we talk about. And certainly in deep learning, it's basically all built on top of this one model. Uh, so that's what we're going to do first in the first half. We have a simple plan today. So we do a review. And we have a break. And then after the break, we're going to talk about the last pure linear model that we're going to see in this course, which is called the support vector machine. Uh, which is um, really just one more of these loss functions. We've seen a few of these loss functions before. Um, least squares, uh, the least squares loss function, the cross entropy loss function, and sport vector machine is another one. But it's a bit special because we can use it as a loss function or we can use it in a different way, which I'll go into. And that different way allows us to apply something which we call the kernel trick. And the kernel trick is one of the more interesting and imaginative tricks that we can use in machine learning. And before deep learning arrived on the scene about four years ago, or maybe six years ago, uh, kernel m methods were the hot way to do everything. So this was the sort of the last big way to do machine learning before deep learning came along. Uh, which doesn't mean it's now dead, it's still very useful. Uh, so it's very, it's very powerful, very useful method to know, so that's what we'll, uh, we'll finish on. But before that, we will remind you of, uh, I will remind you of some of the basic and important uh, subjects, aspects of linear methods. So this is the formula that hopefully by now you are familiar with, that you've seen a few times. This is a linear function with some weights w and a bias or an intercept b. And this we can use to do linear regression and to do linear classification as follows. So let's start with the very simplest example. Linear regression, oh. oh. Is this better? All right. Um, so linear regression. Uh, simplest example, we have one feature, x, and one desired output that we are trying to predict, which is y. And we do so, and we have some training examples, the red dots are examples from our data set, and we predict, we make this prediction by uh, assuming that there is a linear relation between x and y, and in two dimensions we can express a linear relation by taking a multiplier, just one number w, multiplying it by x, 
and taking another single value b and adding it onto that. This is just your basic formula for a line. And then w and b are the parameters of our model. Depending on what we choose for w and what we choose for b, we get either a good model or a bad model. This is a pretty good model. And then in the last lecture I talked at length about how to choose these uh, variables by driving a, uh, setting a loss function, driving a gradient, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're going to leave that for later. For now, we're not going to talk about how to choose the model. We're going to talk about this class of models, how they behave, and what these parameters actually mean, and how we extend this to uh, situations where we have more than one feature. So what does it mean? What do these numbers mean? Um, I think most of you will have learned this in high school, but it's never a bad idea to uh, uh, repeat these things. W is a value called the slope, which simply says that for this line defined by W and B, if we take one step to the right, if we increase X by one, we go up by W, sorry, this should say W. It's in orange, so it should say W. We go up by W, uh, that's the slope of the line, how much you go up if you take one step to the right. So that defines every line Every line that has this angle, this rate of ascent, has the same slope, w. And b is then simply a choice between those lines, between all of the lines with this angle. And b defines for us where the line crosses the vertical axis, where the line crosses the y-axis. So how far, if we set x to 0, how high up are we? Which you can see here, if you set x to 0, this disappears and you le you're left with B. So that's called the bias or the intercept, and it allows us to push the line up or down. But usually we have more than one feature. For instance, we have two features. And then it looks like this. We simply assign each feature its own unique slope. So now we have two slopes, W1 and W2, one per feature. And we still have one bias. And the slope simply defines, if I take one step along the, uh, a step of one, step of size one, along the x's, x, uh, x2, then the output of this function increases by w2. That's the slope along x2, and the same for x1. So if I take a step of size one along axis x1, then the output of my function increases by w1. In this case, we see that it's decreasing, so that means that w1 is negative. So if I move one step up, uh, if I increase x1 by 1, then the value shrinks. So what you can see here is that in two dimensions, this kind of function defines a plane. It's kind of difficult to draw in 3D, but I hope I managed to show that there's a kind of angled plane that you define over these, uh, over these axes. And the B parameter, again, uh, the angle of the plane stays the same, but the B parameter allows you to translate the plane up or down. So that's two dimensions. Uh, if we go to higher dimensions, it becomes impossible for me to draw, but the math is very simple. You just do the same thing again and again. For every feature you have, you give it a slope. So feature one has slope W1, feature two has slope W2, and so on until the nth feature, and then you add one bias. And if you know a little bit of linear algebra, you will recognize this as the dot product of two, fe uh, two vectors, namely the vector w that contains all of these slopes, all of these weights, and the vector x which contains all of your features. If you take the dot product of those two, you end up with this sum here. So W is defined as the vector containing all your, uh, all your slopes, and X is defined as the vector containing all your features. So mathematically, this is a very simple function just to define a plane, in uh, a hyperplane, I should say, in n dimensions. Because in two dimensions, it's a plane. In three dimensions, uh, it becomes a hyperplane, which is just our name for a plane-like thing, but in higher dimensions. So I call this a dot product. Uh, just to keep you up to speed with the notation, you can write it like this, or it's just written like vector multiplication, so you take the transpose of w, you multiply it by x, 
Uh, you can also write it like this, as a dot. And I'm afraid I've used both throughout the slides, and Peter Fleck, I think, uses the second one. So you need to be aware of both notations. Uh, like I said, so we're uh, briefly back to the uh, 1D ver version, just one feature. Uh, our model, the line that we choose, in this case is entirely determined by two numbers, the, two, the W and the B that we've chosen. Which means that we can plot that space, we can put W on the horizontal axis and B on the vertical axis, and pick a point in that space, and then every point in this space becomes a line in this space. So this point becomes this line, this point becomes this line. Uh, so that's what we call the model space. The model space is simply if once you've chosen the shape of your model, so once you've said my model is going to be a line or a tree or something else, then your model space is just the, the abstract idea of the space of all possible models. And sometimes that stays a very abstract idea or sometimes, like, case, uh, like these cases, uh, you can actually visualize it as a plane or a, a Euclidean space. And remember the feature space in this case is just the uh, horizontal axis because we have only one feature here. So that's what I mean by model space. I realized too late that in the book, Flag calls it a hypothesis space, not a model space. So it means the same thing. And you can also call the feature space an instance space. Uh, so now we move from regression. These are regression models, input to output. Now we move from regression to classification. So our aim is no longer to predict a numeric output value, but to predict a class value. Which means that if we use a linear method, we need to take our feature space, this 1D feature space, and we need to cut it in half using a line or a linear thing in such a way that the uh, points of one class are separated from the points of another class. And in one dimension, cutting something linearly in half just means choosing a point and saying everything above this point is blue, everything below this point is red. In two dimensions, it means drawing a line, saying everything above the line is blue, everything below the line is red. Three dimensions, it means choosing a plane, and in four dimensions, I can't draw it anymore, but it means choosing a hyperplane and saying everything above the hyperplane is blue, everything below the hyperplane is red. So it's difficult to visualize, but the math is easy. The math is just very similar to the way uh, it looked before. So how do we define this? <coughs> um, oh yeah, so this is now, it looks, the it looks the same as before, but this is now our feature space, right? We have two feature, we have 2D feature space, feature one, feature two. So you might think, well, we can do the same thing. We can just define a line in the same way we learned to do in high school. So we multiply x by something, and we add something else, and then we get a line. Uh, but this doesn't really work so well for us because we lose this nice property that we had earlier that each feature has its own uh, coefficient, has its own parameter. We scale each feature by one separate parameter, uh, which is kind of tricky to do here. So we need to keep one feature on one side of the uh, equal sign, and it's kind of difficult to tell how we decide whether or not a point is above this line. So we don't do this. We don't take this approach. This is not the form we choose. We basically choose the same form that we used for the other, uh, we used for the re regression problem. We just multiply every feature by its own weight, by its own w. We add a, we add a b. So this gives us one of these planes. And then we check, is it higher or lower than zero? And if it's higher than zero, we assign one class. If it's lower than zero, we assign the other class. So how do we visualize this? What's happening here? 
basically, if we take our feature space, we have 2D feature space now. We take our feature space and we visualize it as a plane. What we're essentially doing, like we did before, in this part of the equation, we are defining a plane. A plane that is above the feature space it's, uh, for the blue point and below the feature space for the red points. And it sort of intersects the feature space. And where it intersects the feature space, that's where our classification boundary ends up. So if you look at this, you can imagine there being a plane that extends above the uh, projector screen over there and below the projector screen over there. And it crosses through the plane, through the screen, at the orange line, at our decision boundary. That's essentially what we're saying here. We draw one of these planes that we did for the regression in some extra into some extra dimension, and if it's higher than zero, we classify it one way. If it's lower than zero, we classify it the other way. A uh, slightly simpler visualization is in one dimension. So if you have one feature, we draw the same line. So this is our one feature. Uh, so the line gives us some value y in some new dimension. And so long as the line is above zero, in this case, uh, we classify it red for above zero. I switch it around. So here, if the line is above zero, we classify it as red. And if it's below zero, we classify it as blue. So you can think of this also as sort of uh, looking at this picture from the side, if you like. So that if you look at it from this direction, so that this becomes a point, then you see this. Uh, this is how uh, Peter Flack defines it in the book, which is slightly different from what I do. So he uh, puts the uh, this sort of uh, B-type parameter on the other side. He calls that a threshold. And he says, uh, we classify something as positive if this value is larger than some chosen t. Which is not very different from what I do, because basically you can rewrite it like this, so you can take the t to the other side, you get minus t. And then if you define b as being minus t, then you get the same thing. So it's not very different. It's just conceptually a little switch around. Uh, but you can think of it, uh, if you like, you can think of it like this. Um, one thing that's important to mention. Sorry, I'm losing my place. Oh, no. Um, I'm not sure what I needed to say here. Um, so let's talk again about the meaning of W and the meaning of B. So W is a vector. And vectors we can think of it as points or as arrows. So if we think of the vector W as an arrow and put it on some point on this uh, decision boundary, then W is the arrow that points in the direction of steepest descent for the plane. That's what we discussed last time. So if you don't know what I mean by that, please have a another look at the uh, Linear Models 1 lecture. But in, thi in this picture, W, the W uh, of this line, the vector that represents this plane, points in this direction, in the direction in which the uh, plane ascends the quickest, which is the direction perpendicular to the decision boundary. And that means that W, our parameter, entirely determines the angle of our decision boundary, all the values w give us the angle of the decision boundary, and b determines how far we push it uh, in the direction of this uh, vector w, which you can see in this picture. So b determines how high up from the origin we are. So if we increase b, then the decision boundary will uh, keep the same angle, but it will move down. Uh, and if we increase b, no, sorry, if we increase b, it moves down, and if we decrease b, it moves up in this picture. So b is sort of, uh, this is why b is called a threshold sometimes, because it, in this case, it um, determines how eager we are to classify something as red. 
So this line here has the same W but a different B and is less eager to classify something as red and this is more eager to classify something as red. So this is how you can use, uh, how you can turn this um, linear classifier into a ranking classifier by moving this threshold up, which is what we discussed in methodology one, our lecture met methodology one. Something else that's important to realize is that we have overdetermined uh, our, um, we have overparameterized our model here, which means, by which I mean, uh, that we can define the same line, the same classification boundary, with different choices of parameters. It's easy to see with one feature. So this green line here, that's our the classification boundary, right? And the orange lines are our planes. And all of these orange lines define the same classification boundary. Or if you want to, oh, sorry. If you want to see it in two dimensions, basically what we can do is we can rotate the plane along this line. So we can rotate it up, increasing B and uh, also, but also increasing the W so that the decision boundary stays in the same place. Or we can decrease B and also adjust the W's proportionally. Uh, so there are infinitely many values of W1, W2, and B for which we get this decision boundary. That's important to know uh, because we are going to use that fact later on. That's actually quite useful and we can use that to do some interesting things which we'll see in the second half. Uh, yeah, this is what I talked about earlier. You can make a ranking classifier by just increasing B. And we learn uh, by gradient descent. Well, we can learn in different ways, but uh, the, the main thing I talked about was learning by gradient descent. So you choose a loss function over uh, your models with respect to your data, and then you iterate following the gradient or the direction opposite of the gradient, starting from some random choice of model, and you get closer and closer and closer to a good model. The problem that I talked about last time was what loss function do you choose for gradient descent? Given one of these models, how do you determine on some data set, on this data set, how well it's done? So in some way you need to decide that this model is terrible, so you need to keep looking and in what direction you need to keep looking. So you need to decide that this model is better than this model. And usually what we're trying to optimize is uh, classification accuracy when we're doing classification or area under the curve. And the problem, if we use that as a loss function, is that we get this kind of loss surface. So this is our model space. We have W1 and B here, W2 is not plotted. We keep W2 fixed just so we can plot it in two dimensions. And this is the accuracy for all the models with this parameter. So if we pick this these parameters, we get this accuracy of uh, three. Oh, the error, sorry. So the number of misclassified examples because it's a loss function, so it needs to be small for the best model. So if we pick the parameter W2 is two and B is zero, then we misclassify three points in the data set. And we can search this space for the point, for the brightest point, the point with the lowest number of misclassified examples. The problem is if we use gradient descent here, for almost all the points in this picture, the gradient is going to be zero because we have a flat plane here with accuracy the same value here. And in all these segments, all these polygonal segments, uh, the gradient is the same. So the gradient gives us no information if we start here, we pick this point, uh, gives us no information about which direction to move in. We have no idea. Until we hit one of these points on the line, then the gradient is infinite because we you instantly jump from one to 1 1.5. That gives you an infinite gradient. So your gradient is either zero or infinite and gradient descent doesn't work at all. So what we need here is a loss function that has a minimum at the say has a minimum at a good model that gives us a minimum somewhere here, but that is smooth. That also gives us a gradient. 
And the first one I showed you was the least squares classifier, which basically says uh, it works in the following, uh, following logic. So we have these points in our feature space. And to build our classifier, we are fitting this line to it. This line that gives us a value y. And if the value y is higher than 0, we classify it one way. If the value high is lower, we classify it the other way. So why don't we just assign some arbitrary negative value to the red points, some arbitrary positive value to the blue points, and just fit a line using regression, using the methods we use for regression. So we just turn it into a regression problem by assigning positive and negative points, and then if we fit a line through this, we should get a line that, is, that tends to be positive for these points and tends to be negative for these points. And if we do this with this uh, sum of least squares loss function, then we get this line, where you basically see here, these are the residuals, the differences between our prediction and the actual data, which we square and sum, and then we try to minimize the sum of those squares. And as you can see, it's a very poor model, right? Because these things are, there's no real line that fits neatly through these things. So we get very large residuals on the outside. And because we square the residuals before we sum them, the big residuals have very, have much more effect, have proportionally much more effect. So if I increase the residual, if I double the size of the residual, uh, because I square it, this residual has four times as much effect as this one. So the line wants to be four times as much, is pulled towards this point four times as strongly as it is towards this point. Uh, so this is maybe not the most natural way of doing this, but it's a very easy way and we do get a smooth loss surface. So another way to do this, which we discussed in the uh, lecture on probabilistic methods, is to take the output of this, this uh, linear function and to pass it through a sigmoid function instead. So then we fit this much more natural line or curve through the points. And as you can see, our residuals are much smaller. So the pool on the line is much, uh, much less uh, pronounced. And the points near the decision boundary have much more pool. Here, the points far away from the decision boundary, which are really not that important, have had much more pull on the line. Here, the points nearby the decision boundary had much more pull, which is much nicer. And we sum the logarithms of these, because we're using cross entropy now, as we discussed in this lecture. We sum their logarithms, so the outliers also have much less effect. Uh, so that's called logistic regression. And in 2D, it looks like this, because it gives you probabilities it gives you this range of very deep red where the probability for red is very close to one. And then as you get towards the decision boundary, it slowly, the probability of red slowly decreases to 50-50, and then the uh, probability of blue takes over. Um, so that's linear classifiers with uh, two different loss functions, least squares classifier and uh, logistic regression, cross entropy loss. And after the break, we're going to talk about the third uh, loss function. But before that, the question, why do we bang on about linear classifiers when most data is not actually linearly separable? Most times the decision boundary is not actually a linear, is not actually a line or a plane but has some kind of curve through it uh, or some other shape. Why do we bang, out, bang on about linear classifiers? Because we can take this as a starting point and we can extend our feature space. We can take these features, these two features, and project them into a higher dimensional feature space to make the classifier nonlinear. And I talked about this in the lecture methodology too but we'll go over it very quickly again because it will be important when we start talking about support vector machines. So here we have a basic two-dimensional feature space. We have a feature x1 and a feature x2. 
and we just extend our data set with ex extra features, which are combinations of the other of the two existing features that we have. So we take the square of x1, and we take x1 times x2, and then we take the square of x2, for instance. But you could do this for any function you like. You could take the sine of x1, or you could take the cube root and the exponential of the other, it doesn't matter. You can design whatever you like, whatever you think might work, uh, or you can just try a bunch of things and see, uh, see whether it does anything. But in general, these uh, what uh, these cross products, so taking two of your features or three of your features and multiplying them, uh, they can be very useful for the following reason. So here we see a uh, data set which is not in any way linearly separable. If you try and separate the red points from the blue points with a line, there is uh, nothing that comes even close. Everything will give you horrible, horrible, horrible performance. But if we look at the function that actually determines whether or not a point is red or a point is blue, uh, these points are one, by the way, the point where the decision boundary changes. Um, then it's basically, uh, if the distance to the origin, if the distance to the middle point is bigger than one, we color it blue. And if the distance to the origin is red, then we color it red. So you can work out from basic Pythagoras that if x squared 1, uh, well, let's draw it properly. So we have the origin here. Uh, and we're looking at this distance, whether or not that's bigger or smaller than 1. So we turn it into a right angle triangle, where this is the size of x1, so this is our point. This is the size of x1, this is x2. So this is a right angle triangle, so if we just fill in Pyth Pythagoras, we get d squared is x1 squared plus x2 squared. So d is the square root of these two guys squared. And what we said is that if d is bigger than one or smaller, uh, if d is bigger than one, we color it blue. If d is smaller than one, we color it red. Now the square root of one is one, so we can get rid of the square root. And all we need to do to figure out whether or not to uh, color a point red or blue is to check whether or not x1 squared plus x2 squared is uh, bigger than 1, which we can do if we have this feature and this feature in our data set. And we can just set the coefficients for all the other features to 0, uh, set the coefficients for these guys to 1, subtract 1 and see if it's bigger than 1. So we get a linear classifier, basically saying if this minus 1 is bigger than 0, we color it blue, otherwise we color it red. So if we do this, if we extend our feature space into these five dimensions I showed earlier, and we apply lo uh, logistic regression, this is the probability function that we fit. Uh, Uh, yeah, you can do this on the playground.tensorflow uh, website I showed you earlier, where you can do the uh, neural network, play around with the neural networks. If you remove all the hidden layers, then it just becomes a, a linear function. And what you see here is that you have the two basic features, x1 and x2, and you can add the cross product. So x1 squared, x2 squared, and x1 times x2. And you can play around with this, and you can see that actually this works if you add these features then a linear classifier like this can be used to fit a spherical, uh, spherical decision problem like I showed you earlier. So that's what we call extending the feature space. You add features and your linear problem becomes nonlinear. Uh, so your linear classifier becomes able to fit nonlinear surfaces.
Um, another step you can take, apart from that, on top of that, is to not just choose these extra features yourself, but to learn them, to make them the output of another linear process, which is essentially what we do when we build a neural network. So here we see a very simple two-layer neural network with these output functions. We can think as a, of the top layer as basically doing logistic regression on these features, the hidden nodes, and then the bottom layer is just doing feature extraction, like we did earlier, we did by hand. We are now doing it with learned parameters. So this is another reason why uh, linear methods are so important, because they are essentially usually the last layer of a neural network is a linear transformation, uh, is one of these linear classifiers. So uh, back to the book. Uh, one reason the story in the book and the discussion in the book is uh, often reads as, as a little different is that he, uh, that Peter Flack often goes in very deeply into how to solve these things, and it can be very different depending on what kind of linear problem you have. Sometimes there is what we call a closed form solution, which basically means that you can compute the gradient of your loss function with respect to your parameters, you set that equal to zero, and then you solve for the parameters. And you can just work out what the optimal parameters are for your problem, for your data. That's called a closed form solution. And you don't need to do any searching, you can just work it out. Uh, sometimes you do have to do a bit of searching, but you know that your loss function is convex, as I discussed also in the Linear Models 1 lecture. Um, in that case, you can still do this searching with gradient descent, but you know that you're going to find the optimal solution. So you can keep, instead of looking at your search and deciding when to finish, you can just keep searching until your gradient becomes one or gets close enough to one. And you can use some slightly fancier methods to find that quick more quickly. Uh, so your whole, you do have to search, but your whole algorithm is basically saying, start searching, go get a cup of coffee and tell me when you found the optimal model. And then when your problem isn't convex, like in the case of neural networks, you have to search using gradient descent, and you don't know whether you find the optimal model because you have all these local optima, and you might get stuck in one of them, and you can search again, and you can search with different parameters, you might find a different one, and if you search again, it might change. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty, and you have to really control this search process. Uh, so depending on your situation, how you fit the model to your data is very different. Uh, but because most of the s models we use these days are non-convex, I've decided for this course to focus mostly on gradient descent. So you should remember that if you have a linear model, then you have a closed form solution and you can actually find it quickly. But gradient descent will also find that, func find that uh, solution for you. Uh, so you can use that as well. And Peter Flack in the book goes into these differences a little bit more and for each model if it's uh, if it has a closed form solution he will tell you how to get that closed form solution if it's convex and he will talk about the convex optimization and stuff like that but I've decided to mostly skip that and just pretend we you can use non-convex optimization for everything uh, that's everything I wanted to reiterate before we move on to the next bit. So just to, before I send you into the break, to put you in the right mindset, start talking about support vector machines. So we have linear problems, we have linear classifiers, back to plain old linear classifiers. Um, and we have two loss functions already, but we're gonna introduce a third, which is based on a very simple, uh, oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. One more thing I wanted to mention to align with the book. Peter Flack talks about something he calls a basic linear classifier, which I haven't talked about, uh, but it uh, operates in a very simple way. What it does, if you have a cloud of red points, cloud of blue points, it finds the mean point for each. So it just computes the mean points, sums all of them up, divides it by three in both cases, draws a line between the two mean points, 
and then draws a line halfway down this line perpendicular to it. Like that. And that it's uh, it uses this as its classification boundary. Which is a very simple way to do it to uh, operate. And Peter Flack uses this as a kind of not as a very practical classifier, it doesn't shouldn't work that well. Uh, but as a way to build on two other classifiers. And it doesn't work for the way I tell the story, but in his case it does work. So if you're reading the book, this is what he means by a basic classifier. So this is what we've talked about. This is a linear function. This is how we turn the linear function into a classifier. Uh, we have an extra degree of freedom, so we can use many different Ws and Bs to specify the same line. We are interested in optimizing accuracy or area under the curve. But it's not actually a good loss, loss function to use when we're searching for a good model. And the alternatives, I stopped typing here, are least squares loss n. Cross entropy loss, which we've seen so far. And now I have a bridge, because we're going to talk about a third loss function. And just before we send you into the break to put your minds, get your minds ready for this, here we have the same classification problem again. So let's look at it very practically, forget about all the lost stuff and uh, all the search. Our aim is to draw a line separating these two points, these two clouds of points. So look at this for a second. I've primed you a little bit with the previous picture, but imagine, imagine the line separating these two points, right? Just have a look, where would you draw a line? If I just came to you without any machine learning, without any background, and I told you, draw a line to separate these two points. How many people do you think would have drawn this line? I don't think very many. I don't think this is a very natural line to draw, right? But it's fine, I mean, it separates the two points. It's just that if we imagine sampling another red point, it's probably quite likely to end up here on the wrong side of the line. And if we imagine sampling another blue point, it's probably quite likely to end up here. It's just sort of an intuition we have. So neither is this a very good line either. So what this final loss function that we're going to look at tells us as an intuition is that this is the line we want to draw, which is the line that has the largest distance to the most nearby points. So you look at the line, it separates the points near neatly, so there are a couple of points which are the closest to the line, one on this side and two on this side. And we can see how far away are these points from the line. And we assume, so these are uh, what we call the margins. We can choose the line so that the margin is the same size on both sides. And we want to maximize this value. That's our intuition. That's what we want to do. These dots are called support vectors. Vectors because they are points in the Euclidean space, so they are vectors. Support vectors because they support the line. Because if I remove all of the data except these points, so I give you just the support vectors, you can still draw the classification boundary. The line in itself is entirely defined by the support vectors. So the question is, how do we find this line? How do we draw this line? And we do this with an uh, algorithm called the support vector machine, which is what we're going to talk about after the break. So take a minute to digest that, and I'll see you in fi uh, 15 minutes. All right, let's get started again. Uh, let's go back to the support vector machines. So just to refresh your memory, we had this idea that the best line that we should draw between two uh, clouds of points that are linearly separable is the uh, line that uh, has the largest margin, the largest distance to the nearby points, the largest distance to the closest positive point and the largest distance to the closest negative point. And those points that define the line, just the choice of those two points, uh, we call those the support vectors. So the question now is how do we take this principle, this idea, uh, 
And how do we turn it into a loss function that we can use in gradient descent or in another other systems to actually find this line and find this line in, in an efficient way? Step one is to use this idea that our uh, linear function that we use to define the loss, uh, the, sorry, that we use to define the decision boundary is overdetermined. And because it's overdetermined, we can choose what value this plane should have, this plane that deci this, uh, decides our uh, classification boundary. We can simply choose that it should have value minus one at the red points at this boundary and value plus one at the blue point at this boundary. We can choose this because we had infinitely many planes intersecting the feature space and we can choose the angle at which the plane intersects the feature space. So we can simply say it should be zero on the line, it should be minus one here, and it should be plus one here. If we look at that from the side, it's sort of doing what we did earlier again. We just give the red points label minus one, we give the blue points label minus uh, plus, two, uh, plus one, sorry. And then we draw the line like this. We pick the two, we uh, assume that it's linearly separable. So we assume there's a linear separation of the two classes. We pick the most extreme points, the points that are closest to where it should be linearly separated. We make those the support, uh, the support vectors. And we fit the line through that. And that's ex essentially what we're doing here. So now we can state uh, our problem. Obviously, in one dimension, it's very obvious where the line should be. And we are, it's very obvious what the decision vector should, uh, so the support vector should be. In two dimensions, it's not so obvious, so we need to search for the support vectors. There are, there's more than one option for what the support vector should be, and we should pick support vectors that give us the largest margin. So how do we define this mathematically? What's our minimization problem, our optimization problem? Basically this. So we want to maximize this value twice the size of the margin, which is just the margin on the one side and margin on the other side. So twice that value is some number, and we want to maximize that number, subject to these constraints. All points in the positive part of the data set that are, that are colored blue, we want to ensure that they are bigger than or equal to one. And all points in the negative part of the data set, we want to ensure that they are less than or equal to minus one. So that just ensures that all red points are below this part of the line, all blue points are above that part of the line, and if we do that and we maximize the margin, then we ensure that the margins are pushed up to these points and then we get the support vectors where these uh, values are exactly plus one and minus one. So these are our constraints. Uh, step one to simplify this is to turn these constraints, two constraints, into one constraint by simply taking this value y, which is plus one for blue points and minus one for red points, and multiplying it by the constraint. So if we multiply this by one, uh, this by its y value, which is plus one for all of these points, well, we're just multiplying by one, so it stays the same. We keep this constraint. If we multiply this side by y, which is minus one for all these points, we get the negative of this, which should be smaller than minus one, which means that y minus this, y times this, should be larger than plus one. So we, uh, we uh, end up with this. So we unify the two constraints into one constraint. Because if you multiply by this one, then minus this value should be larger than my, then. So if this is minus one, then minus this value should be larger than one, which we can invert. So we multiply by minus one. So this becomes positive this value should be less than minus this value. Because the, equals the, the inequality flips, away the uh, flip, flips around the other way when you multiply by negative one. So this is basically saying that for all x, this should hold. And that's our constraint in one, uh, 
uh, expressed in one constraint. So now we have to deal with this part. We want to maximize twice the size of the margin subject to this constraint. How do we express this mathematically? In this picture, how big is this? Given that this is all true, given that we found a line such that this is true, we found a plane sorry, such that this is true, a W and a B, how do, uh, how do we compute what this distance is? The first thing we can do to make it easier on ourselves is to say that the lower margin intersects the origin. We can say that without, uh, as we say in mathematics, without loss of generality. Because if we move all the points around so that the uh, decision boundary lands on the origin, the margin doesn't change. So we can just translate the whole data set so that that margin is on the origin. And the size of the margin doesn't change. So we assume that, that, that that's the case. And then we draw a perpendicular line across this to the other side. We want to know the length of this line. So we call the point, and this is this point uh, is just the origin. We call this point A. And so now what we're really after, the size of the margin, is just the magnitude of the vector A. So that's our question. What's the magnitude of the vector A? Oh, we know two things. At this point, Wx plus B should be minus 1, and at this point, Wx plus B should be plus 1. So we have this. This is the origin. So this is a vector containing zeros. W plus B should be minus 1. WTA plus B should be 1. And if you have two uh, equations that look a lot like each other and you want to solve for some value, one good trick to try is to uh, take, one, uh, take the left side of this, subtract it from the left side of this, and take the right side of this and subtract it from the right side of that. Uh, which is then also something that's true and usually allows you to solve things. Uh, incidentally, this one is zero. The dot product of anything with zero is zero. You can see this from the definition of the dot product. So we just get, if we, sub if we take this and subtract this, we just get WTA plus, plus B minus B. So that turns into WTA. And if we take this and subtract this, we get minus minus one. So it's plus one. So here we get two. So that gives us this. We now know that the dot product of W with A is 2. And we look at the definition of the dot product. Uh, not the one you're familiar with, but the other one. There are two definitions of the dot product. And so you can look them up if you, uh, if you don't remember this. But uh, this is one definition of the dot product. It's simply saying that if you take the dot product of W and X, the dot product can be expressed as their the product of their magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. If you think of them as vectors, you take the cosine between those vectors. Uh, you multiply it by the product of their magnitudes, you get the dot product. In this case, we know that A and W point in the same direction from the way we've constructed them. So cosine A is 1. So their dot product is just the product of their magnitudes. So we get rid of these vectors and we get two scalars, two numbers. Now we know to what to do with numbers. So we just take w to the other side and we get that the magnitude of a is 2 divided by the magnitude of w, which is what we're after because a was the distance we were after. So now we can rephrase our uh, optimization problem a little bit more mathematically. We are looking for a w, vector w, and a scalar b such that we ma uh, 2 divided by the magnitude of w is maximal, subject to the constraint that this holds. Uh, now, we tend to minimize things in machine learning. We tend to like loss functions, which are optimal when they're minimal. Uh, so we turn this around. We minimize, we flip the two around, then we minimize it. Uh, so it just means the same thing. We just uh, get a minimization objective. So one half of the magnitude of W such that this holds true gives us what we call a hard margin support vector machine. And it's interesting to note 
that almost everything we want to know, almost everything we're interested in that defines our problem is encoded in the constraint. If we remove the constraints and we just optimize this, then W becomes zero. It's very easy to minimize W, the length of W. We just set all of them to zero. But we're looking for the minimal W such that these constraints hold. Uh, of course, not all data sets are purely linearly separable. We've taken a bit of a naive stance by expecting that. Sometimes there are a couple of points that ruin your separability, but otherwise, except for those two few points, your data set is properly separable. So you want to be able to deal with that. We do that with a soft margin support vector machine. And the soft margin support vector machine works like this. You take the uh, original uh, hard margin optimization problem and you soften the constraint a little bit. So you're saying this still has to be large, for all points, this has to be larger than one, which is just saying all points have to be outside the margin, except for every point, we can add a little slack variable, which I've called P. Uh, Flack calls it chi in the books. I try and minimize uh, the use of Greek letters. So I call it P for penalty. So P is just saying you can lie a little bit inside of this margin, Point i can lie a little bit inside of this margin, as determined by p. Uh, but in return, I'm adding something to the loss function. So your loss function gets bigger, get less, gets a little bit less minimal. Uh, so now it becomes a trade-off. Either you allow lots of points inside the margin, and this becomes a really big term in your loss function. But maybe by allowing those points inside your margin, you can actually increase the margin massively. So that's a trade-off. How much do you allow the violation of this constraint? And how much of a margin do you get in return? And C, in red, is a hyperparameter. So you choose C, and C tells you how much you're allowed, how much your support vector machine is allowed to violate the constraint. Just a visual clue. So here we have a uh, problem that is not linearly separable. There is no decision boundary you can choose on this line that separates the two points perfectly. But what we can do with this penalty, uh, with this, uh, these slack variables, is say we're going to put the support vectors here. These two guys are going to be the support vectors. And we're going to pay a penalty for these two guys. So this is now our decision boundary. The decision, uh, the the uh, decision boundary is here. This is the plane. So these two guys are on the wrong side, are inside the margins, and this is the penalty we pay. How far away from one this is. So that's the soft margin support vector machine, which is the version that's almost always used. So now we have two options, two ways we can go. We can do it the old-fashioned way, which is option two, or we can do it the modern way. So the modern way is sort of since 2012, since we all started doing deep learning and we all started doing neural networks, and everything was gradient descent anyway. Basically, uh, option one g uh, expresses everything in terms of W, gets rid of the constraints, and gives us a loss function that we can use on the top layer of our neural network. So we can take this loss function, we can take this idea, and use it on the top layer of our neural network, get a gradient, and propagate that gradient back down to the rest of the neural network. The other option is, like I said, to express this line, that the line that we found, the whole optimization problem, in terms of choosing support vectors. Because the support vectors fully determine the line. So we rewrite the problem into a problem of choosing support vectors. And we get rid of W. W is implied, but it's not part of the minimization problem. And why do we want to do that? Because it gives us the opportunity to apply what is called the kernel trick. We don't know what the kernel trick is yet. Well, most of you, most of you won't. So we're going to talk about that. But if we uh, go this route, then we can apply the kernel trick. And that's fun. So we're, uh, well, it's fun. It's uh, very useful. 
So that's option two. So option one is the easiest, so let's do that, deal with that one first. Uh, and we can get rid of this um, these constraints very simply by integrating them into the penalty. So we can rewrite this penalty as uh, this function. Basically, this says, uh, instead of saying the, uh, uh, setting the constraint that pi should be larger than zero, we just say the penalty, depending on where the point is, uh, respective to the uh, the plane, is either this, this is how much, if the penalty is on the wrong side, this is how big it needs to be to uh, uh, counter this, uh, this fact that we violated the constraint. Or if it's on the right side, then it becomes positive, so then we just clip it. So p is either zero, if point i is x i is on the right side, then we don't need a pi, so pi is zero. And if pi is on the wrong side of the margin, then we need pi to be this big. And if we do that and fill it in, we get rid of the constraint, and our problem becomes to, to minimize this function. So here we have, we minimize the weights, subject, or well, subject to nothing, but we just have a loss term, uh, loss function with two terms, which we can use as a loss function on the top layer of our neural network, and we can just compute the gradient and propagate the gradient downwards. Uh, there's a little discontinuity at this uh, inflection point where we go from this point to this point, so there's a little hard corner, but in practice that really doesn't matter very much. You can square this, this is also sometimes done, you can square this thing to get rid of that as well. But in practice, um, the ReLU classifier that I told you about, not the classifier, the ReLU activation function in neural networks that I talked about, which goes like this, it also has this discontinuity and it works fine. So it's never really a practical problem, even though strictly technically it's not differentiable in that point, but it doesn't usually matter. So if we do this, we can just put this as the loss function for our neural network. So that's option one, which is very simple. So just to remind you, we've now discussed three loss functions for linear classifiers. The least squares linear classifier, which ties rubber bands to all of your points, and the further out they are, the stronger they pull on the line. The uh, cross entropy, together with the sigmoid function, which transforms your line into this S-curve, and then ties the rubber bands to that, uh, which gives you much smaller rubber bands and gives you the biggest pull near the decision boundary. And then we have the soft margin SVM which also, like the cross entropy, uh, almost all but ignores the points that are far away from the decision boundary and determines the line only on the basis of the points that are close to the de de decision boundary, which is what you want. That's the points that give you the most information about where to draw the line. So these are the three loss functions we have. That's where we close the book on loss functions and we go into this option two which is really where support vector machines get interesting. So we go back to our optimization problem. And instead of getting rid of the constraints and writing everything into an unconstrained optimization problem, we are going to get rid of the W. We are going to write everything, more or less going to write everything in terms of constraints, in terms of weights on the data saying which data, which points in our data should we pick as our support vectors. And before I can uh, do that, before I can show you how to do, th do that, we need to talk a little bit about how people, how we normal normally do this kind of optimization under constraints. If we have a problem like this, optimize this function given these constraints. The way people usually do this, uh, analyze these kinds of problems, it's is with something called Lagrange, Lagrange multipliers. So here's a very simple example. We have a very simple constraint optimization problem. We have one uh, polynomial function and one very simple constraint on that function. Just to show you the mechanics of it, what we do 
is we uh, create another function called L. Uh, which, well, sorry, this is wrong. It has just one alpha, so the um, new function has the original parameter A and one extra parameter called the Lagrange multiplier. And this function is just the old function with an extra term from which we subtract the extent to which the constraint is violated. So if we pick A in violation of this constraint, then it's constrained by this amount. We multiply that by the Lagrange multiplier. And that gives us this function L, or this function L. And if we solve, if we take the gradient of L set it equal to zero and solve it with the constraint that alpha is bigger than one, uh, bigger than zero, sorry. So alpha needs to be positive. Um, this system also determines the solution to this system. So we have taken this system and we have rewritten it to this system. We have taken one problem and rewritten it to another problem. You might think, What's the big deal? What do we gain? What do we get out of this? We still have something to solve. We still have a, a bunch of constraints. The idea is that this is a very simple positivity constraint. Just this multiplier that we've added needs to be positive. Whereas this could be anything. This could be highly nonlinear, combining lots of variables. It can do anything you like. And you've translated it into a simple positivity constraint. The price you've paid is that it's no longer a minimization problem. You have to explicitly solve the uh, solve the gradient equal to zero, set the gradient equal to zero. So you cannot do use this for gradient descent because if you plot this function of two variables a and alpha, it looks like this. So you get a function on this side for a, which has a minimum because it's a basic parabola, but along the alpha dimension, it has a maximum. So it's a saddle point, which means that if you take this function and you do gradient descent to find the uh, point where it's minimal, so you pretend you're a marble and you roll down the surface, you're just gonna go all the way down and get bigger and bigger A's. So you have to actually look for the point where the gradient of L is zero but it does usually allow you to rewrite your function in very useful ways, and that's what we're gonna use. Uh, that's all I can say. Uh, I'll just give you the general formulation of Lagrange multipliers. So you have some function that you wanna minimize, and you have a bunch of constraints. You can have multiple constraints. Let's say you have n constraints. Then you, uh, for every constraint, you add a variable to your function. You create a function with more variables, the original a, plus one alpha for every uh, constraint that you have. You multiply the extent to which your constraint is violated by alpha, and you sum all those and you subtract it from fa. And then you get this kind of problem, uh, uh, this kind of statement of your problem. I debated with myself a little bit whether or not I should, how deep I should go into this and how much intuition I should give you and basically, it's not really important enough to explain this properly. I don't expect you to fully understand how this works or why this should work, why this is the case. Uh, all I really want to say is this is a method. It works like this. Take my word for it. It works. And it's called Lagrange multipliers. So if you see it, it's just a way to rewrite your problem. And now that you know that, I can show you how to rewrite the SVM problem to get rid of the W. And again, that's not something you have to be able to do yourself. I just want to want you to see it once. And if you think, uh, I never ever want to do any machine learning ever again after this, then you get a good grade and don't worry about it. And if you go to, uh, if you do a machine learning master, then at some point you're gonna have to learn this properly. But this is not a, a this is just sort of a, a hint at how this works. Because now there's a big bit of math coming up when we rewrite these objective functions. So this is what we had. This is where we are starting off. And this is what we're gonna end, off, uh, gonna end up with. And this is gonna be one of those parts of the lecture where there are going to be a lot of mathematical symbols on the slides. <laughs>
So just to orient you and to keep you on track, even if you can't follow along, this is what we're starting with, this is what we're going to end up with. So we're going to show that this solving this problem is the same as solving this problem. The alphas here are all the Lagrange multipliers that we've introduced. And as you can see here, we have removed all the pi's and all the w's. And the alpha, we get one alpha i for every point xi in our data set, which is just a weight, just how important we think that point is. And it turns out if we solve this problem, that almost all the alpha i's are going to be zero for the points we can delete. And only for a few points, alpha i is going to be one. And those points are our support vectors. So if we solve this problem, we directly get an indication of what our support vectors are. And as you can see, the data only occurs on one place in this formulation here, as a dot product. All we need to know here in this uh, formulation, here we loop twice over the data set, i and j. So we check all every point in the data set against every other point in the data set. We take the dot products, so we take all the possible dot products between two points in our data set. And this formulation means that if I have a data set, I compute all of these dot products, and I give them to you, but I don't show you the original data. So you don't get to see the data, you only get to see the dot products of every data point with every other data point. You can give me the support vectors. You can compute the support vectors without seeing the data. That's what we're going to use to do this uh, kernel trick. That's why, ultimately, that's why all of the hard work that's coming up is going to be necessary. So we can get a formulation of this problem in terms of purely the dot product, just to help you motivate, help to motivate you. So let's do this. We're going to start here, and we're going to end up here. And the first thing we do is we apply these Lagrange multipliers. So for every constraint we have, for these constraints, we add an alpha. For these constraints, we add a beta. And here we add Lagrange multipliers for this constraint. So for this constraint. And here we add Lagrange multipliers for the positivity constraint on pi. And the other two terms, this term and this term, are just from the original minimization problem. And we do a bit of rewriting. So this big function, this big term here, we can multiply the alphas in and we can multiply the y's in. And then we get a big sum here, big separated sum. And we can turn that into four separate sums over, uh, over i. And if you're not really familiar with this uh, big sum notation, this uh, This notation, if that's sort of strange or alien to you, uh, and you're going through this, just uh, for yourself, try and write it out in nor as a normal sum. So imagine there are just three Qs. Then this is just equal to Qi, uh, sorry, Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. And then usually the little tricks that allow you to uh, rewrite it and separate it out like this. Uh, they are very apparent from simple things that you are allowed to do with sums like this. So it may, it may look a little scary if you're not used to this, this sum notation, but it's, uh, it's usually very intuitive if you rewrite it to something like this. Uh, so that's what's happened here, and then here we do the opposite. So we have a sum of these things uh, that are all multiplied by pi. So we move pi out of the brackets and we turn it into one big sum. And then we end up with this. So this is our L function, our uh, minimization function with the Lagrange multipliers included. And now it's going to get simpler. We're going to make this function a lot simpler uh, by taking the gradient. So we take the gradient of the L function with respect to the parameters. First, with respect to W. Uh, I'm cheating a little bit here because I'm using matrix calculus, which you haven't had yet. So normally we would say take the derivative with respect to one of the elements of W. And then it would be a partial derivative, which we've discussed in the uh, preliminaries. 
Now we're sort of taking all the partial derivatives of W in one go. But matrix calculus, so taking the derivative with respect to a vector, works very similarly to the way you normal, uh, taking normal derivatives works. So what you see here, this is basically the square of the vector. The dot product is basically the square of the vector. So you take this square uh, exponent, you move it in front, and you get just one, uh, one times the vector as a result. So that's just the dot product, of, uh, the derivative of a dot product works like that. You end up with this. And here we have the vector times some constant that doesn't depend on the vector, so the vector falls out. Just like it would happen if this were a regular scalar w, this just falls out and you end up, oh yeah, and the rest doesn't depend at all on w, so you end up with this. The derivative of L with respect to the whole vector is this function. And we set it equal to zero. And we solve, so we just take this to the other side. So now we know something about w. At our optimum, at the point where this uh, optimization problem is solved, w should be equal to these values. So essentially, these are our uh, data points. We uh, multiply them by yi so that the positive data points stay positive, but the negative data points become negative. We weight all of them by these alphas, and weighted, they should sum to the to w. So the size of w is that uh, that value. Uh, you can do the same thing for b. So we take the derivative of L with respect to B. That's even easier because almost nothing of this depends on B. All these terms uh, disappear except this one. So the negative of this is the only thing that's left over. And if we set that equal to zero, we know that just this should be equal to zero. So all the alphas of uh, positive points summed up should be equal to all the alphas of negative points. Oh yeah, and on the right side of the slide, I'm taking notes of the things we have derived, we have worked out so far. So this is from the previous slide. We're just putting that on the side to remember it. So we put that on the side as well, and we take the derivative with respect to the pi, which is on this side. So this whole part disappears because it doesn't depend on pi. We just look at this, which is just uh, a big sum over all i. And for a specific pi, there's only one term in this sum that depends on that specific pi. So we uh, remove the rest of the terms, and it's just some constant multiplied by pi, so the derivative is just that constant. And we set that to zero, and we remember that alpha i and beta i are Lagrange multipliers, so we have positivity constraints on them. We know that alpha and beta are positive, so one of the things you can derive from this is the fact that alpha should be uh, larger than zero, which we already know, uh, and less than c. Because c is equal to, if you move this to the other side, c is equal to alpha plus beta. Uh, so this is just a little uh, fact that we're going to use later. And if you look at the original function here. Oh, we'll do that later, sorry. So, uh, this is our last uh, thing that we derive from the uh, partial derivatives. So we take the partial derivatives of this function, and we end up with this extra knowledge. This is now what we know about what happens when we minimize this function. And we can use this now in the original function. We can fill this in. We can take this w, fill it in here. We can use this and fill it in here. So let's start there. So we take this, we know that this is zero. Well, it occurs here. So this whole term disappears because this is w, uh, this is b times this. This is zero, so that disappears. We know that this is zero. For every term in this sum, we know that this is zero. So this whole sum also disappears. So that's easy. Now we know that at, at the minimum, at the point where the, this function is optimized, the function turns into this, which is a lot simpler. 
So we now have this. Our problem is to find the point where the gradient of this is zero, subject to these constraints. We have a much simpler problem now. But we still have these w's. We still have to get rid of these w's. So it's going to get a bit more complex now before it gets simpler. So we take this w, this definition of w, and we fill it in in these three places where it occurs in the function. So we get this, which is one of these w's, dot product. So this represents a vector. So the dot product of this with itself, and the dot product of this with this, which is the same thing here. So this is actually the same thing as this. So we have the same thing twice here. We have 1 half times this minus 1 times this. So 1 half times something minus 1 times sam something is minus 1 half that something. So we reduce to this. We just subtract this from this, so we get minus 1 half this plus this. Now the last step before we get to our finish point, we're almost there, is to look at this and to remember that vector multiplication is distributive. So if we have three vectors and we sum them into the sum of those three vectors, and then we take the dot product of that sum with the vector d. We can do the same thing as we would do if d were a number. We can move it inside the brackets because vectors, vector multiplication is distributive, so that is allowed. So this is equal to the dot product of a and d plus the dot product of b and d plus the dot product of C and D. So we can do the same thing in this sigma notation, but it's going to look a bit more complicated. So we take this function, which is analogous to our D, and instead of taking the dot product of this big sum and then taking the dot product of D, we move D inside the sum and take the dot product for every term individually. So this is our d, and we just move it inside the sum and take the dot product individually. And then we do the same thing again the other way around. So imagine we have this thing here, this i, on this side. We can move that inside the other sum. And here I've um, renamed the index from i to j just to keep them apart. Otherwise, we would get, we would get a name clash. So we take this vector here and we move that inside the sum. So now we get two sums, two loops, as it were, over i and j. Uh, and uh, in every term in that, uh, that big loop, we compute these dot products. Now we can remove the brackets. I've used square brackets to make it visually more clear, but these are just brackets. They're just parentheses like these ones. There's nothing special about square brackets. Doesn't mean anything special. So we get this. We just uh, move the scalars to the front and keep the vectors at the back. And we get this. So we loop over our data set twice, look at every point in our data set compared to every other point in our data set. We multiply the alphas for those two points. We multiply the y's for those two points. And we take the dot product of the two points. Deep breath, and that is what we wanted to end up with. So this is one of the constraints that was left over, uh, the two constraints that were left over from our rewrite. So now we have our minimization problem rewritten purely in terms of dot products between the vectors. And I am seriously running out of time. So let's go through this quickly, The basically the payoff. Why is this useful? Well, we have these dot, uh, dot products. Like I said, if I take a data set, I compute all the dot products, and I give them to you, you don't need to see the original data set to compute the uh, support vectors. And that is essentially what allows us to uh, 
perform this kernel trick. And the kernel trick is basically I replace the dot product by another function. I replace the dot product by my own function, which expresses something, some distance between two points, some, uh, some way two points are related. And I give you those dot products. And then you can compute the vector, uh, the support vectors. You can compute the decision boundary on the basis of those dot products, which is basically computing the decision boundary in another space. So that's a kernel function. Instead of computing the dot product, I compute a kernel function on every pair of points in my data set. I give those to you, and then you do support vector machine, uh, you compute the support vector machine for it. So then this becomes the minimization problem. It's the same as before, but I've just replaced the dot product with a function k. And this allows us to do this, what I showed you earlier, extending the feature space, taking your original features and projecting them into a higher dimensional space. It allows you to do that much, much more efficiently and in much higher feature spaces. Simple example to illustrate. Imagine you have two two-dimensional points, A and B, and you decide to extend the feature space to include these cross products. And in fact, to make the example simpler, we throw away the original feature, so we're gonna do classification or whatever in this three-dimensional space. We just take A squared as a feature, A2 squared, uh, A1 squared as a feature, A2 squared as a feature, and A1 times A2. So that's our new three-dimensional feature space. It turns out, and I thought I won't show you the rewriting, you can work this out pretty easily. Uh, if you take the cross product of these two, it actually turns out to be the, cro uh, sorry, the dot product of these two, it turns out to be the dot product of these two squared. That just works out that way. If you do this on paper, it's a, maybe I'll make you do this for the homework. I'll save you the math for now. It just works out that way. Which means that if we do this trick where I um, compute the dot products for you and you, you compute the support vectors, but instead of giving you the plain dot products of A and B, I give you, these dot, I give you the squares of the dot products. And if I do that, the support vector machine that you're fitting for me, the line that you're giving me, is essentially a support vector fitted in this three-dimensional space instead of in the two-dimensional space. And I've never had to actually compute these three new features because I can just take the old dot product and square it. It's a big deal, you might say. It's not a big, it's not a lot of work to compute the extra features. Well, it can be if you go to, to bigger feature spaces. So if you use this as a kernel, it's very similar to what we just did. You just add a one and you raise it to the power d, a degree. That's called a polynomial kernel. The equivalent feature space that you're essentially expanding to for these two is all squares, all cross products, and all single features. So if I run the support vector machine with this kernel, and this is very easy to compute, right? I get a s it's essentially like fitting a for support vector machine in the extended feature space that contains all these extended features. That's just for D2. For D3, I get all cubes, all squares, all three way, uh, uh, all ways to combine three of the uh, features in the original, uh, uh, this should be three way and two way cross products, and all single features. So that's a huge combinatorial explosion. This is a huge, if I wanted to really actually expand all these features, create them, I would get a huge high dimensional data set, and it would be very difficult to fit uh, a line, a fit a classifier in that space. But what I can actually do is just compute these cross products, these dot products, or this kernel instead of the original dot products. And this is very easy to do, right? This is just, you add one and you raise it to a power. That doesn't cost anything. There's no almost no extra cost to fitting the uh, support vector in this space. And I'm actually fitting a line in a much higher dimensional space. That's a polynomial kernel. It's also something called an RBF kernel, which works like this. Uh, I won't explain it, just it's this function. So you take the distance, the Euclidean distance between A and B, 
you multiply by some gamma, negative of that, and you take the exponential. Uh, it looks a bit like a normal distribution, if you're familiar with that, but it doesn't matter. So just take my word for it. This is a kernel, and it expresses some kind of distance between A and B. And if you fit a support vector machine using this kernel, it is equivalent to fitting a line in an infinite feature space. So you can do this, well, you can do this in a feature space, but you can approximate it. So this is essentially, you're projecting your data into an infinitely high dimensional feature space. You're fitting a line there and then projecting it back. But you can do this because of this kernel trick. Because we have a method that uh, we can fit using just the cross pro uh, dot products. And then we can do, uh, we can make things even cooler by uh, defining kernels directly on the data space. So if we have something like text or DNA or proteins for the um, bioinformaticians, this is a very, uh, very important function in your field. Um, we can define a distance function on those data objects without extracting features. So between texts, you can define um, string added distance. Uh, between graphs, there's something called the weiss lehmann distance. So you can define this distance function in your data space before you extract any features, without extracting any features. Give that distance function to your support vector machine as a kernel, and it will give you the support vectors. It will give you uh, the things you need to classify in this implicit feature space. Uh, so that's a very powerful model, especially when you're trying to compare things that it's difficult to extract features from. You can use kernels, and you can use them in your data space. Um, so that's a big, long, and complicated story with lots of math. If you want to actually do this in sklearn, this is my last slide, by the way. These are the things you have to do and remember. Remember to normalize your data. It's very important, especially if you use a kernel SVM, you have to normalize your data, otherwise it doesn't work. You have to choose a kernel. That's you know a hyperparameter, which one you choose. You just have to see which one works best. Uh, sklearn comes with linear, RBF, and polynomial. Linear is just, just a dot product, so you don't use a kernel. You have to pick C. Again, that's a hyperparameter. You, I can't really tell you how to choose it, but it's it expresses how much, uh, how strongly you require that your data is linearly separable. And if your kernel has hyperparameters like D for the polynomial kernel or gamma for the RBF kernel, then you have to pick those two. Again, you probably have to do it through cross-validation. There's not a lot of intuition there. And then once you've done that, you write three lines of sklearn, and you can do all of that uh, stuff I've just been talking about. And that's my last slide. So thanks for sticking around, and I'll see you on Thursday.